Um, turn to the book of Jude, if you would, or actually the postcard of Jude. Uh, it's very easy to find. Just go to the, to the right, which is easiest for you conservatives to do, to go to the right. Uh, find the book of Revelation and then go back one book, and uh, it's probably about a page and a half. It's the small little postcard or text uh, of Jude. Um, one of the things that I always appreciate about being a Christian is that you never stop learning. Um, when I was a child, I learned something about God that was very, very important. Um, I prayed for a bicycle. There was a bicycle that I really, really wanted, and I prayed for it. I prayed for it for weeks, for weeks, and then I realized that God wasn't going to work that way and answer my prayer. So I stole the bike and prayed for forgiveness. <laughs> No, it's just a bad joke, just a bad joke. So, but um, this morning I want to talk about something that is rarely talked about in, in church, something that I have learned not too long ago as an adult. And what I want to do today is I want to talk about this issue that I think many of us struggle with but are afraid to talk about, and that's this issue of doubt. Uh, look at uh, the book of Jude, and let's start there. Um, uh, look at verse 20. I'm going to focus on verse 22 for the most part. He says, But you, dear friends, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, <clears throat> expecting uh, the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. And then here it is. Have mercy on some or on those who doubt. We're going to talk about doubt this morning. And let's, let's begin in prayer. Father, I... I want to set this time apart for you. It already has been sanctified. It has been set apart for you. But we pray now that I pray, I pray now that uh, your Holy Spirit would move among us and, and really comfort those of us that may ex be experiencing some doubts that may be on the, on the fence between faith and, and, and uh, agnosticism. And I venture to say there are those that are here. And so I want to give this time to you and pray that you would use me uh, to be able to speak to this issue clearly and concisely and encourage those who may be um, in a place of, of doubt. So we give you this time in Christ's name. Amen. If you were to read this little postcard of Jude, you'd re re realize that Jude comes down very, very hard on false teachers and those that have abandoned the faith. Yet, even so, in verse 22, with a little softer tone, he says, have mercy on those who genuinely have doubts, or be gentle with those who are honestly and humbling, struggling with some aspect of the faith. I was talking to someone not too long ago, um, and near the end of, the, of my conversation with this individual, uh, he says to me, Pastor Steve, when you speak, you sound so certain about everything. Do you, do you ever doubt? And I had to pause for a minute and say, do I give him my Pastor Steve answer or do I tell him the truth? And so I decided to tell him the truth. I said, I do have doubts. I don't like to talk about them much, but there was a time when my doubts became so severe as a pastor that I considered abandoning the faith. And so I want to talk about doubt today, again, because if I doubted, if I had those kinds of doubts. I'm certain that you also are experiencing some doubts right now. And when we talk about doubts, we're talking about three types of doubts, or from my own experience. And that, what I'm sharing to you, I'm being very vulnerable this, this morning because I'm just sharing you from my own experience. And what I've learned in my experience is that there are intellectual doubts. Uh, these are the doubts that most people uh, are, often, are often raised by those people that are outside of, of the church. Uh, they'll ask questions like, well, is the Bible truly the Word of God? Is Jesus really the Son of God? Did he really rise from the dead? Did he even, is he even an historical figure? But then there are those spiritual doubts, intellectual doubts, and then there are spiritual doubts. These tend to be the doubts of, of those that are inside the church. That means you and me. Uh, am I really a Christian? Um, have I, I truly believed? Uh, why, why is it so hard for me to pray? Why do I still feel guilty? Why is it uh, taking most, uh, so long to, to get my life together, Lord? What's, what's going on? They're, they're the spiritual doubts. 
But thirdly, there are the circumstantial doubts, and these are the ones that I think a lot of us struggle with more than anything else, and that's, is that's the, the whys of, of life. Why did my child die? Why did my marriage break up? Where was God when my uncle was abusing me? Couldn't God have prevented 22 people from dying in that senseless mass shooting in El Paso, Texas? Or couldn't he have stopped the nine from dying uh, and being gunned down in Daytona? And these circumstantial questions are the ones that we meet at the intersection of faith and the pain of living in a fallen world. Um, these are the toughest doubts, or they're the toughest for me uh, uh, to deal with. And, and we tend to sometimes sweep those kinds of doubts uh, under the carpet because there are no easy answers. In fact, oftentimes there aren't any answers at all. And uh, we have a tendency, tendency as well to, to put down those in a church who struggle with these kinds of issues. But so we kind of sweep them all under the carpet. But when we refuse to deal with circumstantial doubts, uh, they soon become spiritual doubts, and spiritual doubts eventually become intellectual doubts, and then people start leaving the church altogether. And so it's important that we deal with our doubts. And so I want to I want to talk about that today, and I want to explain to you and tell you how I navigated my journey, and I call it this, from the valley, uh, uh, my journey through the valley of the shadow of doubt. And it was, it, it felt like a death on many occasions. I'd been a Christian for nearly, I have been a Christian for nearly 50 years. In October, just thinking about this, had a revival in 1969. And uh, if my math is right, it, I will have been a Christian in October for, for 50 years. I've been in the ministry for 30, maybe a little over 30 years. Uh, I entered the ministry with the understanding that if you preach it, they will come. <laughs> and when they didn't come, in the number, they did come, but not in the numbers that I had expected. I suddenly began to question my calling. I had to do a sermon every week, and I would prepare. I would pray, and I would prepare, and, and, and I would diligently study the Scriptures. I felt that that was my responsibility, was to know the text and, and to diligently study the Scriptures. And I did that week after week. And while Jesus said His yoke is easy and His burden is light, I felt like that I was doing all the heavy lifting, that uh, God wasn't really revealing things to me. And I, I you know, and so uh, I, I pray for Holy Spirit inspiration, but, but and it didn't come. And so I did what, what a lot of pastors do. And I really, I'm, I'm confessing a sin here. I, I begged, borrowed, and stole uh, from every author I read, and I plagiarized every pastor, you know, that, that I could. And, uh, and my personal time with God had become a real chore. It wasn't a joy uh, at all. Uh, the scriptures were so dry, I might as well have been reading a phone book. Remember what those things are? <laughs> phone books, you know. My prayer life ultimately became non-existent. I mean, why pray? I mean, God wasn't there anyway. That's how I thought. Um, and I'd pray for people, and I'd see no results. And so I would continue to pray for people, going through the motions of, of believing that God was going to answer my prayer. But in reality, I didn't believe that he was going to to answer my prayers. They were just empty words that I spoke to bring comfort into people's lives. I had that heart. I wanted, to, I wanted to comfort people. But the reality is I had no expectation that God would answer any one of my prayers. So I continued to preach week after week. I used to function as a Christian uh, as if nothing was wrong. But uh, inside I felt abandoned by God and I felt that, and these were very harsh words for me to have said, and I've said them to a few friends uh, at the time, I felt like God was an absent father. Well, eventually, as you might guess, as a pastor, my faith hit rock bottom. And who's the fraud, I thought, me or you? And no matter how badly I called out to him, he seemed nowhere to be found. But in that place of darkness and emptiness and feeling abandoned, um, I learned some things about doubt as I came through the valley of the shadow of doubt. First of all, off, I learned that any person who takes God seriously is going to experience doubt. Any person who takes God seriously is going to experience doubts. Faith requires doubt in order for it to be faith. If you ever arrive at a place where all your doubts are gone and all your questions are answered, take a big deep breath and relax because, folks, you're in heaven. <laughs> Wherever there's belief, doubt always tends to follow. 
It's like two sides of one coin. You got doubt on one side and, and faith on the other. Why is that? Because as one man said, we are keenly aware of human fallibility. We know we can get things wrong or partially right, so no matter how certain we might feel on our convictions, there is always a chance that a perhaps moment of doubt will surface. Perhaps I'm wrong, or perhaps it isn't true. And so when it comes to spiritual matters, doubt and belief come as a package deal. And that's why we don't like to talk about it, because we might be exposed to that question of perhaps, maybe I'm wrong. A second thing I learned about doubt is this. We are told, or it's implied, that doubt is a sin. But folks, it is not a sin. Unbelief is a sin, not doubt. Doubt wrestles with what God says. Unbelief refuses to believe what God says. Doubt searches for evidence in support of the Scriptures. Unbelief denies the evidences in support of the Scripture. Doubt is a crisis of faith. Unbelief has a closed-minded certainty against faith. It just, it, there's just no way. I'm not going there. And faith is not the absence of doubt. It's the means of overcoming it. It's what we do in the face of doubt. And thirdly, and this is probably the most important thing for me that I have learned through my own journey to the valley of the shadow of doubt, that doubt can be a means of great growth. Bill said something very interesting uh, to us in the staff meeting. He said, counseling takes us out of the cave, but spiritual direction takes us deeper into the cave. Doubts can be a useful tool in the hand of God to get us to go deeper into the darkness to explore some things that need to be brought to the light, deep-seated things that, that need to be brought out into the open. And the only way that you'll enter that or go deeper in the, into the cave is if you have experienced some doubt. You need to have some resolution. Is there something God wants to deal with? Takes us deeper into the cave. Or maybe there's some psychological stronghold that God wants to free us from. Something that goes back all the way to our childhood. Doubts take us deeper into the cave to explore so things can be brought to the light. And I've also noticed this, that the Bible doesn't hide the truth about doubt, but mentions it over and over and over again. Job, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, Habakkuk, all deal with the issue of doubt. The father of faith, Abraham, faltered in his faith. John the Baptist was in prison, pointed to Jesus with a great certainty that this is the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the Christ, the one to come. And, and, and then in prison, uh, a few years later, he asks the question, are you the one to come or do we look for another? He had doubt. And then there's the most notorious doubter of all, Thomas, although I think I could rival him. <laughs> Thomas. Almost everyone that Jesus ministered to expressed doubt or asked him probing, provoking questions. But never once do you see him condemning them. He was more tolerant with those that doubt than most churches. He saw instances of doubt as teachable moments and promoted dialogue more often than not when he came face to face with doubt he would ask the question one way or another of why why did you doubt like when peter stepped out of the boat in faith and suddenly you know got slapped in the face with a little bit of water and realized hey walking on water people can't do this Boom, starts to sink and jesus goes he didn't go he said why did you doubt why did you doubt let's talk about this answer the question for him and i don't think he thumped him in the chest why did you doubt I think he's going with a smile on his face. Hey, man, you were doing good. What happened? How come you faltered? I want to know why. Let's have a dialogue about this. He dialogued with a seeking legalist um, named Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He dialogued with a marginalized Samaritan in John chapter 4. Jesus was overjoyed when genuine faith was shown uh, like the centurion in Luke chapter 7, but he never condemned those of lesser faith. Instead, he caused people, he'd have conversations, he'd have a dialogue, and he would force people to look at life in a new and different way. He understood that it takes time uh, to overcome cultures of fear and questions. So, so how do we deal with doubt in a productive way? Well, I wish I could tell you it was easy. 
and that I was going to present to you a very uh, quick three-point answer to how to overcome all of your doubts. Well, I can't do that because there is no easy way. My path through the valley of the shadow of doubt was a winding road, and there were a lot of mountains to climb, and there were a lot of canyons that I had to cross. And so I wanted, what I want to do the rest of this time this morning is share with you just the pathway that I took personally in hopes that it'll help you the path I took through the valley of the shadow of doubt. Number one is this, is I had to come to peace with the mystery of God. That's kind of a popular word right now, the mystery of God, but I'm not comfortable with mystery. I'm not, cover, I'm not comfortable with gray. I, I, I like black and white, but I had to, I had to, I had to make peace with, with the mystery of God. You see, I deal with things in a practical way rather than theoretical or abstract. I find comfort in knowing that there's a reason for my spiritual struggles, but more often than not, there never is no resolution. There is no reason why. I, I, I talk with people all the time, well, I went through this difficulty and this challenge and, 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 and this is the reason why. I think that's cool and God will do that every once in a while, but more often than not, there is no resolution. Isaiah 55, 8 says, um, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my way, says the Lord. That's a very true passage of scripture. My thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways aren't your ways. And I hate that passage. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. I hate it. I struggle with it, but there I struggle with that passage because I want I, I, I want resolution. But I've also learned this that trusting God means you have to give up your right to have an answer for everything. I had to accept the fact that the Christian faith means being confronted moment by moment with what is counterintuitive and ultimately beyond my understanding and comprehension. I had to learn to hold into balance two truths. Number one, I've shared this before, these two truths that God is sovereign and answerable to nobody, especially me, but also he's good. I had to hold these two concepts in tension with each other, to balance each other out. God is sovereign, answerable to no one, but he's also good. In other words, you don't have the privilege of calling the shots. You can't, as Burger King used to say, have it your way. God is sovereign. But also at the same point, nothing will enter your life that God does not either decree or allow, allow but neither will, he, uh, will there be anything that enters your life that he can't or will not work out for good and his glory. That's the tension that I hold in balance, sovereignty and goodness. So I had to come to peace with the mystery of God, and that was my biggest battle, and still is my biggest battle. But secondarily, I had to ultimately uh, make a decision. Um, one of the things that kept me in the game of being a Christian, uh, so to speak, was Peter's declaration of faith in John chapter 6, when after all, uh, Jesus, after feeding the 5,000, began to, they wanted to forcibly make him king, and Jesus says, well, if you want me to be your leader, you have to understand you have to drink of my blood and eat of my body. And people were just offended by that. I mean, that was very scandalous. It spoke of cannibalism. And they didn't understand. And so when there were thousands of people there, in moments they just all began to drift out. And all that were left were just a handful of Jesus' disciples. And, and, and he turns to them and says, will you leave me also? And, and I think at that moment they kind of went, well, this is my chance. This is my way out. But Peter speaks up and speaks the truth. He says, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. There's no place we can go. No one offers what you have to offer. And so as much as it would have been, have, have been helpful for me to, in, my, in my battling to have denied that there was a God, that it, there even existed a God, I couldn't. I couldn't deny that. And here's why. In the court of law, there are Two burdens of proof in establishing a claim or the truth of a matter that's brought before the court. Number one is the preponderance of evidence, and the second is beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, hang out with me here for a moment. I'll do my best to explain this. Preponderance of evidence is a burden of proof. This is where, in a courtroom of law, um, uh, the evidence that's presented in a case, uh, kind of usually it's in civil cases, but just kind of tips the scale. Yeah, more likely than not. You know, he, the person probably did this crime, whatever. Just kind of tips the scale that way. But beyond a reasonable doubt is a higher burden to prove. 
It says that after the evidence is examined, there is no other logical conclusion or no, uh, uh, no logical explanation for the facts except that the defendant did the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. It more than just tips the scale. We've examined the evidence and and there are some doubts, but they aren't reasonable. This person did it. And so using that standard of beyond a reasonable doubt, I held court in my own mind. And I put the existence of God to the test. And after examining the evidence for his existence, I came to the conclusion that there's no better explanation for creation than a creator, God. Now, I'm not going to go through all my mental gymnastics because they went for years, but but. But here's one piece that was very convincing for me. The existence of the universe is better explained by the existence of God than evolution. The existence of the universe is better explained, not concretely, but better explained by the existence of a God. You see, everything that comes into existence is caused to exist by something else. And there cannot be an infinite series of past causes. There has to be a starting point Therefore, there must exist a first cause. In other words, the first cause always existed. And who would that be? It has to be a God. Now, is that concrete, boilerplate evidence for the existence of God? No. There are holes in that argument. But are they reasonable uh, holes? Are they, there are doubts, but are they reasonable doubts? In my mind, it's more reasonable that the universe exists as a direct result of a designer, a first cause, rather than random chance. And that's the conclusion that I came to. Secondarily, there's the issue of the matter of a right and wrong or moral obligations. And I concluded in my study, in my research, in, in, I came to the verdict that the existence of objective moral obligations are better explained by the existence of God. Um, the sense of morality, the sense of that there's a right and there's a wrong is consistent with uh, all people in all cultures throughout all time. By that I mean it is wrong to murder another person, no matter what culture you live in. It's wrong for me today, it's wrong for a citizen in Canada, for someone in Mexico, Uruguay, wherever. And it was wrong for someone who lived in 500 B.C., Murder was wrong. And where did that sense of right and wrong come from? I say, personally, as I examined everything, I concluded, my verdict was, is that this is the imprint of the moral character of God within each one of us uh, in, in, in whose image we are made. And moral obligations aren't impossible without God. There are moral people um, who don't f follow God or his ways but they are more likely if God exists. And so I concluded that objective moral obligations tip the scale in favor of a God. So the next question I had to answer was, but does he desire to have a relationship with me? Admitting that there was a God made me a deist. It means that there's God, but he's not really active with his creation. But I needed more than that. So I had to ask the question, does he desire to have a relationship with me? And as I read the Bible, since the creation of man, it's always been God's desire to be in relationship with people. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord as he walked in the garden. After sin entered the picture and upset everything, God predicted in Genesis chapter 3, that there would be one who would come that would repair that breach and reunite humankind with God, his, their creator, once more. And so for thousands of years, God brought humanity through a series of events, a flood, and then Abraham, who be became the father of the Jewish nation, and out of the Jewish nation came one that would die on a cross to put humanity back together. And, and I see that that's the focal point of all history all history moving this way from Genesis to Revelation and also from eternity uh, beyond, the, the, the cross will stand forever as a main focal point of God. He was moving all creation to that point where Jesus willingly went to the cross and died for our sins and reunited humankind once together with his creator. That was God's design from the very beginning. Why did he design that? So that he could have a relationship with, his, with humankind once again, his, with you, with me. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 5, through one man, 
Adam came sin and death. But if many died through one man's trespass, much more lived through the grace of God and the free gift by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. Sin came as a one, uh, separation came as a result of one man, restoration came as a result of one man, Christ. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it was God's intent to rescue us and reestablish us uh, an everlasting relationship with, uh, with us through Christ and his voluntary death. He says that, that yea, I, I stand at the valley or at the door and knock, and if anyone will open the door, I will come in and have a sup with him or have dinner with him, which means have fellowship with him. So from beginning to end, it's been God's desire to have a relationship with us. That's what I saw when I read the scriptures. That's what I saw. And so I realized that God did desire to have a relationship with me. Now, neither of these in my brain, my brain were empirical proof that of the evidence of God. None of them were, but they tipped the scale. And using the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt made me say, there is a God and he desires to have a relationship with me. I was in college down at uh, Vanguard University and uh, I sat in a class with... Uh, Dr. Murray Dempster, it was a philosophy class. I loved it, it was great. And um, he talked about the pink elephants that were always in the room guiding all of humanity, it was funny. But there was a, a week where he was, part of the syllabus was that he would talk about evidences or arguments for the existence of God. And I was so excited for that. So I sat there, there were like uh, three classes and I sat there and, and he gave evidence of the you know, order and design to the universe, there's teleological you know, argument for the existence of God. But, uh, but he, then he shot holes in it. Then he gave the ontological, the deontological. I don't remember any of what those things were about. But there were the ontological evidences and, uh, for the existence of God. And I said, well, that sounds pretty good until till he shot holes in it. So I came the last day of class expecting that he was going to save the zinger for the end. One solid good argument for the existence of God. Instead, he gave us a pop quiz. That was it. So I was mad. And I gathered up my books and I stormed up to Murray's office and I knocked on the door, you know. I said, Murray, you're a bad teacher. <laughs> I said, I've been coming to your class, you know, waiting for this for a whole semester, waiting for this. And I wanted the argument for the existence of God. And, and, and you, didn't, you didn't do it. You didn't give a good argument for the, a solid empirical argument for the existence of God. And he looked at me and says, well, where does the Bible tell us you ever accept Jesus through empirical evidence? Nowhere. So I said, excuse me, <laughs> never mind, you know. Well, he was right, you know. And so are, are my arguments that I'm presenting to you, are they boilerplate evidence for the existence of God? No, and you'll never do that. But if you logically and objectively examine the evidence, there is a God. And he loves us and wants to have a relationship with us. And using the standard beyond a reasonable doubt, I think that you would come to that conclusion as well. And so having answered those two questions, is there a God and does he want to have a relationship with me? I realized that after my conclusion that there was a God and he did desire a relationship with me, that I was responsible for my verdict. And I had to make a decision and make a decision for him or against him. And I made a decision for him. Were there still doubts? Yes, but not enough to keep me from surrendering my life totally to Christ. And I still have doubts, and I work through them with him. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, again, I made the decision to totally embrace Jesus. An important move in my journey through the valley of the shadow of doubt, because Hebrews eleven six says, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, that he is, and that he rewards those who seek him. And then, having done that, I needed to change my attitude. It's been said, and I believe it to be true, that, the only, that, that only God can change a heart, but he won't change a heart until you change your mind. And again, I was in the mindset, and it said several times, and felt and declared to my wife and those that were close to me that, that God had abandoned me in the ministry that he was an absent father. But one morning I woke up and had an Elijah-like experience. And it was a real breakthrough for me. Um, I've been wrestling with these things for years. But I woke up, and, and, and like Elijah in the cave, I heard a still, small voice. Now, I don't hear voices. 
you know, I, I, but there was a thought. You know what I'm saying, you know. There was a thought that came to mind in my mind. I was waking up. I was in that place between awake and asleep, and there was a, a thought that came to my head uh, uh, that says, you can't say that God abandoned you anymore. You can't do that. And so I chose to change my mind and not to think that way again, based upon good evidence, I think. And then I began, it began to change my whole outlook. And here's something that helped me really realize that God had not abandoned me and that he wasn't an absent father. I took a step back and looked at my life from 30,000 feet, from start to finish. You see, in a microscope, um, my life, look, it looked like at the moment that God had, had abandoned me. That's how I felt. But from 30,000 feet, I couldn't deny the fingerprints of God all over my life. When I was a kid, um, back in 19-whenever, um, <laughs> I was, um, I was an attention deficit kid in a time when, when no one understood what ADD, ADHD was. And so I got stuck in remedial classes. And, um, um, and it was real shameful for me. And I had grown up with all kinds of feelings of shame and, and inadequacy. And um, after, uh, in my, as I was going into my junior year, between my sophomore and junior year, I got a random call from someone I'd never met before. And, I may have shared this with you before, but he was a cross country coach for Medford. And, and I, I had some pretty good athletic skills, but I would never go out because for football, which is God in Medford, or was God. And, uh, um, and I wouldn't go out for fear of just, I couldn't do it. I, I'd, I'd fail like I would at everything else. And he said, come out for the cross country team. And so I did. And, and I said, nobody watches cross country anyway, so I can't really fail to. And I really liked the guy. I really liked him. I, and. and um, he, um, uh, after the cross country, uh, after my junior year uh, of high school, I, I had some success in cross country and I had some success in track. And then he said, he said to me, if you do everything I tell you to do, you become state champion one day. I said, baloney, that happens to other people, not to people like me. Well, it happened, you know, a year later, I, I did. Believe it or not, I, I used to be a pretty, I was a distance runner. What are you laughing at? My wife, my wife said, Steve, you need to get in shape. I said, honey, round is a shape, you know. So, but, but, but I did. And then from there, I met this man, and, and, and he was a Christian, and he introduced me to Christ. And, and then I had a, a scholarship to Southern California College or Vanguard University right now, and I, an athletic scholarship, and I, and I did fairly well. And, and it was a, a Bible school, and I was training for, for ministry. And, and then I met this beautiful woman there. She, she was moving across campus and her feet weren't moving, you know, little wings, you know. <laughs> you know, my wife Debbie, and, and I married her and she's the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, you know, it really was a marriage made in heaven and I've been married to her this month uh, 45 years and it's just, it's, it's been fascinating, you know, to her. And then I became, I became a police officer and, and suddenly I realized, I mean, it really fit my learning style. I never should have been a, co a cop because I, I made a very bad mistake that would have, you know, probably uh, should have eliminated me, but, but I'm not going to tell you what it was. But I learned from it, and, and being a police officer really built up my self-esteem and really prepared me uh, for, for being in the ministry. And then I was in the ministry at Applegate, and then I had my church up in Salem, and now I'm here, and I look at the fingerprints of God and say, he never once abandoned me. He was with me every single step of the way. So sometimes it's good to let, step back and examine your life from 30,000 feet, and you'll see that God is with you, even in your doubts at this very, very moment. So that's my story of... of, of of my journey of doubt to faith. And if you, like me, have doubts about the existence of God or, or whether he wants a relationship with you um, or have a sense like I did that God is an absent father or, or you feel that he is distant and uninvolved, here's some things for you to consider. And I, again, I hope these things would be helpful for you. Number one, you doubt, but know this, God isn't angry with you. He isn't angry with you. I wish it were different but I'm not wired in such a way that simple faith comes easy. I, I love the analogy of some sports, you know, basketball. A guy like Stephen Curry gets across half court, fires up something just at half court, hits nothing but net. They say he throws up a prayer. That's my wife. Nothing but net. Hits every time. Me, I'm like Jacob. I wrestle with God. I wrestle with stuff. And I don't think Jesus um, is put out 
with those of us who are kind of skeptical by nature. Uh, he, he, he's not put out by us, but I think he likes the up-close personal contact of a good wrestling match, of a good smackdown, some good MMA, where I, I ultimately have to tap out. He says, come and contend with me. I think that means put on the gloves, man. Let's go a few rounds. I'm not put off by it. We'll learn t- through this whole thing together. He isn't angry with you, uh, with you, Dad. I mentioned Jacob in Gen- Genesis uh, chapter 32. He wrestled with stuff all night long. And, and, and in the morning, um, he reached out and said, you're not leaving this place until you bless me. And, and the angel says, well, what's your name? He says, Jacob, which means cheat or something like that. He says, I'm changing your name to Israel, means, which means you have wrestled with God and prevailed. You prevailed. You won. And I think God likes that. Is that when we wrestle with God, we prevail. And I don't think that, that he sits on his throne when we doubt, complaining to the Father about our struggle. I believe he's interceding for us. I believe he is patient and tender with us as we wrestle through the vital matters of life. In Mark chapter 9, a weary man with a demon-possessed son expressed a shaky faith in Christ's claims and abilities to heal. And he cried out, I believe, I believe, but help my unbelief. Well, did Jesus say, you gravy-sucking pig, I'm not going to free you, your son, until you believe me firmly. No, Jesus graciously healed the boy and in doing so strengthened this doubting man's faith. And I believe that's how Jesus works with us today. We wrestle and we prevail and he strengthens our faith. At some point, I've learned this too, that, and hopefully this is helpful for you, that you'll have to, as I did, cross the bridge of doubt to faith by believing there is a God and that he desires to have a relationship with you. So I would encourage you to do your homework, as I did, whole court. Use that standard of a re- beyond a reasonable doubt. Examine the evidence for yourself. There will be doubts because we come to him by faith. But ask yourself, is my doubt reasonable? Which way does the scales tip in his favor or against him? And I, I'm, I'm convinced that if you objectively and honestly and openly stack up the evidence, the, the scale will tip towards God and that he wants a relationship with you, and that he'll never abandon you and never leave you, even though you feel that he might. Talk to God. Don't be afraid to talk with him, and don't be afraid to be honest about how you feel. Tell him about your disappointments, and and don't cover it up. You aren't telling him something he doesn't know already. It's better to work through your doubts rather than just avoid them and sweep them under the carpet. And you aren't being blasphemous or disrespectful by saying that you are disappointed or you don't understand him. You're being earnest. And the Bible says in James, the earnest prayer of a righteous man avails much. Let him talk to you. And how do you do that? By reading the Bible. I read the Bible every day in preparation to write a sermon, but I I didn't read it for the purpose of seeing who God really was. It was purely academic, putting together a sermon. In the end, I pushed God away, thinking that he couldn't help me. I believe that because I didn't truly understand how great he actually was. And folks, if you'll take the time to figure out the God uh, who uh, you are supposed to to have this deep, intimate relationship with, then you're going to uh, allow him to meet the needs of your life. So read your Bible and study and learn the heart of God. Look for Jesus. Look for Jesus. So talk to him. Let him talk to you and then talk to someone else. Don't be afraid to be open about what you're thinking. They may not have answers, but it's good to verbally process. I like what uh, Chuck Swindoll, he says, thoughts disentangle themselves over the lips, talking, and through the fingertips, writing. So it's good to just to process verbally. And if you're a person uh, being talked to, just listen. Just listen to that individual. And there's power just in your very presence. And then step back and examine your life from 30,000 feet. At times, you may feel abandoned. But stepping back and examining your life from 30,000 feet, you'll see that the fingerprints of God all over your life and how intricately woven into your life he really is. And this is important, number seven. 
and this was important for me, I had to learn to shake hands with my doubts. I had to learn to shake hands with my doubts. Socrates says that the unexamined life is not worth living. And I think the same could be said about faith. That a faith unquestioned and untested is not faith at all. Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote, there lives more faith in honest doubt than in half of the creeds. I'm grateful for my questions and my discomfort with my faith because they caused me to what? Go deeper in the cave and examine my life. And my faith is no longer a blind, mindless acceptance of things that I've been taught in church. It's my faith now. It's a tested faith. It's not my parents' faith. And it's a solid confidence now that's based on convincing evidence. And if we don't actively work to reconcile our doubts, they can lead to, as I shared earlier, a departure from the faith. But they can also be the means of growth and learning. I still experience doubt. Questions will always come. But now I know that those questions um, can end up feeding my faith and then in instead of diminishing it. And then decide to have a relationship with God. After you examine the evidence, at some point you're going to have to cross that bridge and make that decision. The Bible says that the only way to God is to know his son Jesus. Jesus was God with skin on, God in the flesh, and gave us the way to know him and be in relationship with him. Now maybe you're still unsure. Maybe you're listening here and you're still a little bit unsure and you're not at all encouraged. That's okay. That's okay, I get it. So let me make a suggestion. Rather than contemplate these things <clears throat> and things that you don't know, maybe the best thing you can do is focus on what you can know and simply receive those things and give thanks for those things that you can know for sure. Thank the Lord for a delicious meal. Just start there. Thank the Lord for some music that moves you the laughter of your child. Thank the Lord for a depth of a relationship. Maybe the smell of your baby's head. Maybe just accepting these gifts and cherishing them is all the faith that you're able to muster right now. That's okay. If you do this, you may find that this contentment is the beginning of a pathway back to what you've lost. So let me finish with this. I've come to think that maybe just maybe, that those who cry out to God and are honest with him about their doubts and disappointments are on the precipice of a true and deep communion and relationship with God. You're on the very precipice. Maybe it's, it's a doubt that we die to ourselves and, and uh, maybe it's the doubt that we uh, die to ourselves and put our overactive Western realistic thinking into its proper place. Maybe it's through that 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 happens. Again, Jacob wrestled with God all night and the following morning when he attempted to leave, Jacob grabbed his leg and says, you're not leaving here until you bless me. And he says, you've wrestled with God and you've prevailed Maybe that's the wrestling with God. Maybe that's the way that we free ourselves of a limited or a false construction of God that we've built on our own minds. God wants to get rid of us and reveal the true him to us. Maybe it's as we wrestle that we come to that understanding. Anyway, that's my journey through the valley of the shadow of doubt, and I hope that it's hopeful, helpful for you as well. Well, that's it. Have a good day. Stick around in fellowship. We've got people over here that'll pray for you. There'll be pastors up front. They'll be more than happy to talk with you. And as I always say, listen, don't leave yet. Give me your attention. You are now dispersed. <laughs>